Part Two, Chapter One of Passing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Passing by Nala Larson. Part Two, Re-Encounter. Chapter One. Such were Irene Redfield's memories as she sat there in her room, a flood of October sunlight streaming in upon her, holding that second letter of Clare Kendry's. Laying it aside, she regarded with an astonishment that had in it a mild degree of amusement the violence of the feelings which it stirred in her. It wasn't the great measure of anger that surprised and slightly amused her. That, she was certain, was justified and reasonable, as was the fact that it could hold, still strong and unabated, across the stretch of two years' time, entirely removed from any sight or sound of John Bellew, or of Clare. That even at this remote date the memory of the man's words and manner had power to set her hands to trembling, and to send the blood pounding against her temples, did not seem to her extraordinary. But that she should retain that dim sense of fear, of panic, was surprising, silly. That Clare should have written, should, even all things considered, have expressed a desire to see her again, did not so much amaze her, to count as nothing the annoyances, the bitterness, or the suffering of others. That was Clare. Well, Irene's shoulders went up, one thing was sure, that she needn't, and didn't intend to, lay herself open to any repetition of a humiliation as galling and outrageous as that which, for Clare Kendry's sake, she had borne that time in Chicago. Once was enough. If, at the time of choosing, Clare hadn't precisely reckoned the cost, she had nevertheless no right to expect others to help make up the reckoning. The trouble with Clare was, not only that she wanted to have her cake and eat it too, but that she wanted to nibble at the cakes of other folk as well. Irene Redfield found it hard to sympathize with this new tenderness, this avowed yearning of Clare's for my own people. The letter which she just put out of her hand was, to her taste, a bit too lavish in its wordiness, a shade too unreserved in the manner of its expression. It roused again that old suspicion that Clare was acting, not consciously, perhaps, that is, not too consciously, but none the less acting. Nor was Irene inclined to excuse what she termed Clare's downright selfishness. And mingled with her disbelief and resentment was another feeling, a question. Why hadn't she spoken that day? Why, in the face of Bellew's ignorant hate and aversion, had she concealed her own origin? Why had she allowed him to make his assertions and express his misconceptions undisputed? Why, simply because of Clare Kendry, who had exposed her to such torment, had she failed to take up the defence of the race to which she belonged? Irene asked these questions, felt them. They were, however, merely rhetorical, as she herself was well aware. She knew their answers, every one, and it was the same for them all. The sardony of it! She couldn't betray Clare, even run the risk of appearing to defend a people that were being maligned, for fear that that defence might in some infinitesimal degree lead the way to final discovery of her secret. She had, to Clare Kendry, a duty. She was bound to her by those very ties of race, which, for all her repudiation of them, Clare had been unable to completely sever. And it wasn't, as Irene knew, that Clare cared at all about the race or what was to become of it. She didn't. Or that she had for any of its members great, or even real, affection, though she professed undying gratitude for the small kindnesses which the Westover family had shown her when she was a child. Irene doubted the genuineness of it, seeing herself only as a means to an end where Clare was concerned. Nor could it be said that she had even the slight artistic or sociological interest in the race that some members of other races displayed. She hadn't. No. Clare Kendry cared nothing for the race. She only belonged to it. Not another damned thing! Irene declared aloud as she drew a fragile stocking over a pale beige-coloured foot. Aha! Swearing again, are you, madam? Caught you in the act that time." Brian Redfield had come into the room in that noiseless way, which, in spite of the years of their life together, still had the power to disconcert her. He stood looking down on her with that amused smile of his, which was just the faintest bit supercilious, and yet was somehow very becoming to him. Hastily Irene pulled on the other stocking and slipped her feet into the slippers beside her chair. And what brought on this particular outburst of profanity? That is, if an indulgent but perturbed husband may inquire. The mother of sons, too! 
The times, alas, the times! I've had this letter, Irene told him, and I'm sure that anybody will admit it's enough to make a saint swear. The nerve of her! She passed the letter to him, and in the act made a little mental frown. For with a nicety of perception, she saw that she was doing it instead of answering his question with words, so that he might be occupied while she hurried through her dressing. For she was late again, and Brian, she well knew, detested that. Why, oh, why, couldn't she ever manage to be on time? Brian had been up for ages, had made some calls, for all she knew, besides having taken the boys downtown to school, and she wasn't dressed yet, had only begun. Damn, Clare! This morning it was her fault. Brian sat down and bent his head over the letter, puckering his brow slightly in his effort to make out Clare's scrawl. Irene, who had risen and was standing before the mirror, ran a comb through her black hair, then tossed her head with a light characteristic gesture, in order to disarrange a little the set locks. She touched a powder-puff to her warm olive skin, and then put on her frock with a motion so hasty that it was with some difficulty properly adjusted. At last she was ready, though she didn't immediately say so, but stood instead looking with a sort of curious detachment at her husband across the room. Brian, she was thinking, was extremely good-looking. Not, of course, pretty or effeminate. The slight irregularity of his nose saved him from the prettiness, and the rather marked heaviness of his chin saved him from the effeminacy. But he was, in a pleasant masculine way, rather handsome. And yet wouldn't he, perhaps, have been merely ordinarily good-looking but for the richness, the beauty of his skin, which was of an exquisitely fine texture and deep copper colour? He looked up and said, "'Claire! That must be the girl you told me about meeting the last time you were out home. The one you went to tea with?" Irene's answer to that was an inclination of the head. "'I'm ready,' she said. They were going downstairs, Brian deftly, unnecessarily, piloting her around the two short curved steps just before the centre landing. "'You're not,' he asked, "'going to see her?' His words, however, were in reality not a question, but, as Irene was aware, an admonition. Her front teeth just touched. She spoke through them, and her tones held a thin sarcasm. "'Brian, darling, I'm really not such an idiot that I don't realize that if a man calls me a nigger it's his fault the first time, but mine if he has the opportunity to do it again.' They went into the dining-room. He drew back her chair, and she sat down behind the fat-bellied German coffee-pot, which sent out its morning fragrance, mingled with the smell of crisp toast and savoury bacon, in the distance. With his long, nervous fingers he picked up the morning paper from his own chair, and sat down. Zulina, a small mahogany-coloured creature, brought in the grapefruit. They took up their spoons. Out of the silence Brian spoke, blandly. "'My dear, you misunderstand me entirely. I simply meant that I hope you're not going to let her pester you. She will, you know, if you give her half a chance, and she's anything at all like your description of her. Anyway, they always do.' Besides, he corrected, the man, her husband, didn't call you a nigger. There's a difference, you know. No, certainly he didn't, not actually. He couldn't, not very well, since he didn't know. But he would have. It amounts to the same thing, and I'm sure it was just as unpleasant. Hmm, I don't know. But it seems to me, he pointed out, that you, my dear, had all the advantage. You knew what his opinion of you was, while he— well, twas ever thus. We know, always have. They don't. Not quite. It has, you will admit, its humorous side, and sometimes its conveniences." She poured the coffee. "'I can't see it. I'm going to write Clare. Today, if I can find a minute. It's a thing we might as well settle definitely and immediately. Curious, isn't it, that knowing, as she does, his unqualified attitude, she still—' Brian interrupted. It's always that way, never known it to fail. Remember Albert Hammond, how he used to be forever haunting Seventh Avenue and Lenox Avenue and the dancing places, until some shine took a shot at him for casting an eye toward his Sheba? They always come back. I've seen it happen time and time again." "'But why?' Irene wanted to know. "'Why?' "'If I knew that, I'd know what race is.' But wouldn't you think that having got the thing, or things they were after, and at such risk they'd be satisfied, or afraid?" Yes, Brian agreed. You certainly would think so. But the fact remains, they aren't. 
Not satisfied, I mean. I think they're scared enough most of the time when they give way to the urge and slip back. Not scared enough to stop them, though. Why, the good God only knows." Irene leaned forward, speaking, she was aware, with a vehemence absolutely unnecessary, but which she could not control. "'Well, Clare can just count me out. I've no intention of being the link between her and her poor, darker brethren. After that scene in Chicago, too, to calmly expect me—' She stopped short, suddenly too wrathful for words. "'Quite right. The only sensible thing to do. Let her miss you. It's an unhealthy business, the whole affair. Always is.' Irene nodded. "'More coffee?' she offered. "'Thanks, no.' He took up his paper again, spreading it open with a little rattling noise. Zulina came in bringing more toast. Brian took a slice and bit into it with that audible crunching sound that Irene disliked so intensely, and turned back to his paper. She said, "'It's funny about passing. We disapprove of it, and at the same time condone it. It excites our contempt, and yet we rather admire it. We shy away from it with an odd kind of revulsion. But we protect it. Instinct of the race to survive and expand. <sighs> Rot! Everything can't be explained by some general biological phrase. Absolutely everything can. Look at the so-called whites, who've left bastards all over the known earth. Same thing in them. Instinct of the race to survive and expand. With that Irene didn't at all agree, but many arguments in the past had taught her the futility of attempting to combat Brian on ground where he was more nearly at home than she. Ignoring his unqualified assertion, she slid away from the subject entirely. "'I wonder,' she asked, "'if you'll have time to run me down to the printing office. It's on 116th Street. I've got to see about some handbills and some more tickets for the dance.' "'Yes, of course. How's it going? Everything all set?' "'Yes, I guess so. The boxes are all sold, and nearly all the first batch of tickets, and we expect to take in almost as much again at the door. Then there's all that cake to sell. It's a terrible lot of work, though." "'I'll bet it is. Uplifting the brother's no easy job. I'm as busy as a cat with fleas, myself." And over his face there came a shadow. "'Lord! How I hate sick people! and their stupid meddling families, and smelly dirty rooms, and climbing filthy steps in dark hallways." "'Surely,' Irene began, fighting back the fear and irritation that she felt, "'surely—' Her husband silenced her, saying sharply, "'Let's not talk about it, please.' And immediately, in his usual slightly mocking tone, he asked, "'Are you ready to go now? I haven't a great deal of time to wait.' He got up. She followed him out into the hall without replying. He picked up his soft brown hat from the small table, and stood a moment whirling it round on his long, tea-coloured fingers. Irene, watching him, was thinking, "'It isn't fair! It isn't fair!' After all these years to still blame her like this, hadn't his success proved that she'd been right in insisting that he stick to his profession right there in New York? Couldn't he see, even now, that it had been best? Not for her. Oh, no, not for her. She had never really considered herself, but for him and the boys. Was she never to be free of it, that fear which crouched always deep down within her, stealing away the sense of security, the feeling of permanence from the life which she had so admirably arranged for them all, and desired so ardently to have remain as it was? That strange, and to her, fantastic notion of Brian's going off to Brazil, which, though unmentioned, yet lived within him, how it frightened her, and, yes, had angered her. "'Well?' he asked lightly. "'I'll just get my things. One minute,' she promised, and turned upstairs. Her voice had been even and her step was firm, but in her there was no slackening of the agitation, of the alarms which Brian's expression of discontent had raised. He had never spoken of his desire since that long-ago time of storm and strain, of hateful and nearly disastrous quarrelling, when she had so firmly opposed him, so sensibly pointed out its utter impossibility, and its probable consequences to her and the boys, and had even hinted at a dissolution of their marriage in the event of his persistence in his idea. No, there had been, in all the years that they had lived together since then, no other talk of it, no more than there had been any other quarrelling or any other threats. But because, so she insisted, the bond of flesh and spirit between them was so strong, she knew, had always known, that his dissatisfaction had continued, as had his dislike and disgust for his profession and his country. 
A feeling of uneasiness stole upon her, at the inconceivable suspicion that she might have been wrong in her estimate of her husband's character. But she squirmed away from it. Impossible! She couldn't have been wrong. Everything proved that she had been right. More than right, if such a thing could be. And all, she assured herself, because she understood him so well, because she had, actually, a special talent for understanding him. It was, as she saw it, the one thing that had been the basis of the success which she had made of a marriage that had threatened to fail. She knew him as well as he knew himself, or better. Then why worry? The thing, this discontent which had exploded into words, would surely die, flicker out, at last. True, she had in the past often been tempted to believe that it had died, only to become conscious, in some instinctive, subtle way, that she had been merely deceiving herself for a while, and that it still lived. But it would die. Of that she was certain. She had only to direct and guide her man, to keep him going in the right direction. She put on her coat and adjusted her hat. Yes, it would die, as long ago as she had made up her mind that it should. But in the meantime, while it was still living and still had the power to flare up and alarm her, it would have to be banked, smothered, and something offered in its stead. She would have to make some plan, some decision, at once. She frowned, for it annoyed her intensely. For, though temporary, it would be important and perhaps disturbing. Irene didn't like changes, particularly changes that affected the smooth routine of her household. Well, it couldn't be helped. Something would have to be done, and immediately. She took up her purse and, drawing on her gloves, ran down the steps and out through the door which Brian held open for her, and stepped into the waiting car. "'You know,' she said, settling herself into the seat beside him, "'I'm awfully glad to get this minute alone with you. It does seem that we're always so busy. I do hate that. But what can we do? I've had something on my mind for ever so long, something that needs talking over, and really serious consideration." The car's engine rumbled as it moved out from the curb and into the scant traffic of the street under Brian's expert guidance. She studied his profile. They turned into Seventh Avenue. Then he said, "'Well, let's have it. No time like the present for the settling of weighty matters.' "'It's about Junior. I wonder if he isn't going too fast in school. We do forget that he's not eleven yet. Surely it can't be good for him to—' "'Well, if he is, I mean. Going too fast, you know. Of course you know more about these things than I do. You're better able to judge. That is, if you've noticed or thought about it at all.' "'I do wish, Irene, that you wouldn't be forever fretting about those kids. They're all right. Perfectly all right. Good, strong, healthy boys, especially Junior. Most especially Junior.' "'Well, I suppose you're right. You're expected to know about things like that, and I'm sure you wouldn't make a mistake about your own boy.' Now why had she said that? But that isn't all. I'm terribly afraid he's picked up some queer ideas about things—some things—from the older boys, you know." Her manner was consciously light. Apparently she was intent on the maze of traffic, but she was still watching Brian's face closely. On it was a peculiar expression. Was it—could it possibly be a mixture of scorn and distaste? "'Queer ideas,' he repeated. Do you mean ideas about sex, Irene?" Yes. Not quite nice ones. Dreadful jokes and things like that. Oh, I see," he threw at her. For a while there was silence between them. After a moment he demanded bluntly, "'Well, what of it? If sex isn't a joke, what is it? And what is a joke?' "'As you please, Brian. He's your son, you know.' Her voice was clear, level, disapproving. Exactly. And you're trying to make a molly coddle out of him. Well, just let me tell you I won't have it. And you needn't think I'm going to let you change him to some nice kindergarten kind of a school because he's getting a little necessary education. I won't. He'll stay right where he is. The sooner and the more he learns about sex, the better for him. And most certainly if he learns that it's a grand joke, the greatest in the world. It'll keep him from lots of disappointments later on." Irene didn't answer. They reached the printing-shop. She got out, emphatically slamming the car's door behind her. There was a piercing agony of misery in her heart. She hadn't intended to behave like this, but her extreme resentment at his attitude, the sense of having been willfully misunderstood and reproved, drove her to fury. Inside the shop she stilled the trembling of her lips and drove back her rising anger. Her business transacted, she came back to the car in a chastened mood. 
but against the armour of Brian's stubborn silence she heard herself saying in a calm, metallic voice, "'I don't believe I'll go back just now. I've remembered that I've got to do something about getting something decent to wear. I haven't a rag that's fit to be seen. I'll take the bus downtown.' Brian merely doffed his hat in that maddening, polite way which so successfully curbed and yet revealed his temper. "'Good-bye,' she said bitingly. "'Thanks for the lift,' and turned towards the avenue. What, she wondered contritely, was she to do next? She was vexed with herself for having chosen, as it had turned out, so clumsy an opening for what she had intended to suggest, some European school for Junior next year, and Brian to take him over. If she had been able to present her plan, and he had accepted it, as she was sure that he would have done, with other more favourable opening methods, he would have had that to look forward to as a break in the easy monotony that seemed, for some reason she was wholly unable to grasp, so hateful to him. She was even more vexed at her own explosion of anger. What could have got into her to give way to it in such a moment? Gradually her mood passed. She drew back from the failure her first attempt at substitution, not so much discouraged as disappointed and ashamed. It might be, she reflected, that, in addition to her ill-timed loss of temper, she had been too hasty in her eagerness to distract him, had rushed too closely on the heels of his outburst, and had thus aroused his suspicions and his obstinacy. She had but to wait. Another more appropriate time would come, to-morrow, next week, next month. It wasn't now, as it had once been, that she was afraid that he would throw everything aside and rush off to that remote place of his heart's desire. He wouldn't, she knew. He was fond of her, loved her, in his slightly undemonstrative way. And there were the boys. It was only that she wanted him to be happy, resenting, however, his inability to be so with things as they were, and never acknowledging that though she did want him to be happy, it was only in her own way, and by some plan of hers for him, that she truly desired him to be so. Nor did she admit that all other plans, all other ways, she regarded as menaces, more or less indirect, to that security of place and substance which she insisted upon for her sons, and in a lesser degree for herself. Others to help make up the reckoning. The trouble with Clare was, not only that she wanted to have her cake and eat it too, but that she wanted to nibble at the cakes of other folk as well. Irene Redfield found it hard to sympathize with this new tenderness, this avowed yearning of Clare's for my own people. The letter which she just put out of her hand was, to her taste, a bit too lavish in its wordiness, a shade too unreserved in the manner of its expression. It roused again that old suspicion that Clare was acting, not consciously, perhaps, that is, not too consciously, but none the less acting. Nor was Irene inclined to excuse what she termed Clare's downright selfishness. And mingled with her disbelief and resentment was another feeling, a question. Why hadn't she spoken that day? Why, in the face of Baloo's ignorant hate and aversion, had she concealed her own origin? Why had she allowed him to make his assertions and express his misconceptions undisputed? Why, simply because of Clare Kendry, who had exposed her to such torment, had she failed to take up the defence of the race to which she belonged? Irene asked these questions, felt them. They were, however, merely rhetorical. It wasn't the great measure of anger that surprised and slightly amused her. That, she was certain, was justified and reasonable, as was the fact that it could hold, still strong and unabated, across the stretch of two years' time, entirely removed from any sight or sound of John Bellew, or of Clare. That even at this remote date the memory of the man's words and manner had power to set her hands to trembling, and to send the blood pounding against her temples, did not seem to her extraordinary. But that she should retain that dim sense of fear, of panic, was surprising, silly. That Clare should have written, should, even all things considered, have expressed a desire to see her again, did not so much amaze her, to count as nothing the annoyances, the bitterness, or the suffering of others. That was Clare. Well, Irene's shoulders went up, one thing was sure, that she needn't, and didn't intend to, lay herself open to any repetition of a humiliation as galling and outrageous as that which, for Clare Kendry's sake, she had borne that time in Chicago. Once was enough. If, at the time of choosing, Clare hadn't precisely reckoned the cost, she had nevertheless no right to expect— Part Two, Chapter One, Of Passing This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Passing by Nella Larson. Part two. Re encounter. Chapter one. Such were Irene Redfield's memories as she sat there in her room, a flood of October sunlight streaming in upon her, holding that second letter of Clare Kendry's. Laying it aside, she regarded with an astonishment that had in it a mild degree of amusement the violence of the feelings which it stirred in her.